Hey guys, today we're going to get into Einstein's relativity as part of our study of astronomical principles. Uh, so the thing we're going to cover today uh, is first off, why do we even need Einstein? Didn't Newton pretty much explain the world? Um, turns out the answer is no, and we'll see where the cracks started to appear. Then we'll get into uh, Einstein's postulates, which is the assumptions that Einstein made when he came up with his versions of physics, Einstein's relativity. And finally, we'll get into the phenomenon of time dilation, and that will be enough for today. So first off, let's start off with uh, where things start to go wrong with Newton. And um, one of the uh, landmark uh, holes in his theory appeared with what was called the Michelson-Morley experiment, the Michelson-Morley experiment. Now, I want you to be familiar with this, even though it's not talked about in the book. Um, the Michelson-Morley ex experiment is one of the landmark physics experiments in the history of science. It's up there with the, uh, the gold foil experiment when Rutherford um, discovered the neutron, of the, uh, the, uh, the nucleus of the atom. Uh, this is this is truly one of the one of the huge ones and uh, is necessary for your just kind of your scientific literacy and scientific education. So Michelson and Morley were two stern looking individuals who uh, lived in the 1800s. Uh, Michelson was an American physicist um, who was the first American to win the Nobel Prize. So this guy had an excellent reputation. Uh, he got his Nobel Prize for uh, accurately and precisely measuring the speed of light, which is something that, that had only been done approximately before, uh, but he got a pretty solid number on it. And he was recognized worldwide as being a very solid theorist. Um, that's actually important to this because the result he got was weird and people would have ignored it and dismissed it completely if he didn't already have a pretty solid uh, reputation. Uh, Morley was his assistant who worked uh, worked with him on this particular experiment. So Michelson's specialty was measuring the speed of light. Now what Michelson, Michelson and Morley tried to do was figure out something about a thing called the ether, which is spelled a couple different ways up here, the aether or the ether, um, which was a um, theoretical idea that turned out to be wrong. But at this time, they thought that there must be some substance that filled the universe that was the medium, the material that light could travel through. Because at this time, they knew something about waves, and it was believed at this time that a wave could not exist. A wave could not travel from one place to another unless it had some material to travel through. So for example, uh, when you shake a rope, um, waves travel through the rope. But if there is no rope, there's no waves to travel through the rope. You can't have the waves without the rope. Uh, likewise, when you throw a rock into water, it makes waves in the surface of the water. And if you don't have the water, you can't have the waves in the water. The waves simply don't exist without the water. Um, and it was believed, it was known at this time that light is a wave. So it was assumed that there had to be some substance that filled the universe for light to travel through. There had to be some medium that for, the, uh, for the light to travel through. Now, it turns out they were wrong. It turns out, and we're going to learn this in a later unit, that you don't need a medium to carry light. Uh, that's one of the unique things about light. So this ether that they were looking for did not exist, but they didn't know that. And they were trying to figure out something about the ether, which people believe must, must, be, uh, must be out there. Okay, so they thought that they could learn something about the ether itself if they shined light in different directions and then measured the speed of light in different directions. They thought that by doing this, they could figure out how fast the ether itself moves. Okay, so for example, if you throw a rock into a pond, the water waves will spread out in all directions at the same speed because the water is not moving. But if you throw a rock into a river, the waves will spread out from where you hit the rock, but the, the waves themselves will slide downstream with the river. So the, the speed of the waves upstream will be different than the speed of the waves downstream. And from the difference in those speeds, you can figure out how fast the water is moving. And Michelson and Morley were trying to do this for the ether. They were trying to figure out how the ether moves compared to the earth, or compared to the sun or compared to the galaxy, whatever. They were just trying to figure out how the ether itself moves or if it moved at all. 
So what they did is they shined light in two different directions. And they measured the speed of light back and forth, and they measured the speed of light uh, you know, like north and south and east and west, and then maybe even up and down. So they measured in all different directions. And they were looking for differences in the speed of light so they could figure out which way the ether was moving. Um, but they got this weird result. And so they didn't like this result. So they tried their experiment again and again in as many different ways as they could find, uh, as they could think of. Um, they tried it at the experiment at different times of the day because the earth itself is turning and at midnight, the surface of the earth is going that way. And at noon, it's going the other way because the earth is going around and around. Uh, they tried this at different times of the year because the earth is orbiting the sun. And in June, it's going that way. And three months later, it's going that way. And three months after that, it's moving this way. And three months after that, it's moving this way um, as it's going around and around the sun. So they tried it at different times of the year. Uh, they tried it at different latitudes so that the... Uh, um, uh, that if there was a difference between how fast the Earth was turning close to the North Pole and how fast it was moving around the equator, they should be able to pick it up. And their equipment was sensitive enough to be able to detect, to detect differences in the speed of light on those scales. But the weird result they were getting was that the speed of light was always the same. And it didn't matter whether the source of light was moving or whether the observer was moving. It didn't matter what direction they were moving, how they're moving relative to each other. The speed of light always stayed the same. And this is really, really weird. Okay. This is similar to, um, well, okay. So suppose this, suppose you have a friend with a pickup truck. And the, uh, the pickup truck is parked on the street and your friend who's standing in the back of the pickup truck throws a baseball to you. And you're standing, uh, you know, out in front of the truck somewhere. Um, and the uh, the person throws the the, uh, the baseball to you at, say, 10 meters per second. So it leaves his hand at 10 meters per second. And when you catch it, it's moving 10 meters per second, obviously, because the truck's not moving and you're not moving. And now suppose your friend uh, uh, presumably has another friend driving the truck. But the, say the truck is moving toward you at 10 meters per second. So the truck is now driving down the road. It's coming toward you at 10 meters per second. And again, your friend throws the baseball. And relative to him, relative to your friend, it leaves his hand at 10 meters per second away from his hand. Now, when you catch the ball, you have the 10 meters per second that the person threw it, plus the 10 meters per second that the truck is moving toward you. The ball is moving toward you faster. So when you catch the ball, the ball will be going 20 meters per second, right? Likewise, if the truck is going in reverse and is moving away from you at 10 meters per second, well, now when your friend throws the ball, he's throwing the ball 10 meters per second toward you while the truck is moving 10 meters per second away from you. So the ball's not going to go anywhere. It's basically just going to fall straight to the ground, right? Because the speed of the truck affects the speed of the ball. That's how the world works. So what's weird, weird about Michelson-Morley? The speed of light is always the same. If the baseball behaved the way light behaves, the baseball would always be moving at 10 meters per second when it reached you. So when the friend is standing in the truck, the stationary truck, and he throws it, you catch it, it's moving 10 meters per second. When the truck is moving toward you at 10 meters per second, and he throws it toward you so that it leaves his hand relative to him at 10 meters per second, when the ball gets to you, it's going 10 meters per second. And when the truck is moving away from you and the friend tries to throw it back toward you, the ball gets to you and it's moving 10 meters per second. It's as if baseballs only can move 10 meters per second. That's what Michelson and Morley discovered about light. It always goes the same speed, which is weird. And Newton says that can't happen. The thing we talked about with baseballs, Newton would agree with that completely, and he'd say that's true for all things everywhere in the universe in all circumstances. Michelson and Morley, these two stern-looking gentlemen, they discovered that that's not the case for light. There's something weird and there's something different about light because it always goes the same speed, regardless of the motion of the source or the motion of the observer. Okay, now, Michelson and Morley didn't like this result. Uh, this completely violated the laws of physics as they were understood at the time. 
And Michelson and Morley said, basically it presented as, look, we know something is wrong here. This can't be right. But for the life of us, we can't figure out what we've done wrong. We've tried this and this and this and this. We always get this weird result. Guys, help us out. And they sent it out to the physics community, hoping that somebody would, some, somebody would come back with an explanation for it. Um, and nobody did. Um, and basically the assumption at the time was that, yeah, well, they obviously made some mistake. Um, they're not incompetent. They're not lying to us, but they made a mistake. And someday somebody will find us and we'll go on, find it, and we'll go on with our lives. So the, the observation, the result of this experiment was noticed, but not really cared about for very much. Because these guys were right. Everything about physics was wrong. Now, it wasn't just Michelson and Morley. There was also a guy named Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell. This is the guy right here, another stern looking gentleman who actually did his work before Michelson and Morley. Um, now, a short version of this, James Clerk Maxwell, who's one of the great physicists of all time, by the way, even though he's not very well known outside of physics. He came up with these four equations, which you do not have to know, thank goodness. Um, but these four very simple equations, you can see they're very short and they have very few moving parts. These four equations describe everything about light. Um, and Ma these are called Maxwell's equations, and they're very famous. Uh, three of them actually existed before him. He came up with the fourth and was able to prove that, or demonstrate, not prove, but he was able to demonstrate that the combination of these four uh, equations describe everything you want to know about light. Now, at the time, Maxwell's equations were considered empirical equations. Now, what is an empirical equation? An empirical equation is a rule of thumb that works under some circumstances, but is not generally true about everything. Okay, so for example, um, this is an example of an, an empirical equation. You guys have heard of hydroplaning, which is when a tire skids on water over a pool of water. Um, and it's, it's when the tire loses contact with the, with the street surface because there's a layer of water or a puddle or something. Um, turns out that you can calculate how fast a, a, a wheel has to be going to hydroplane by taking nine times the square root of the uh, tire pressure in PSI. So if you have a, uh, yeah, um, so if you pump up your, your um, car tires to 36 PSI, the square root of 36 is 6, and you multiply that by, by 9, and that gives you 54, and your car will hydroplane at about 54 miles per hour um, if, the, uh, um, if your tires are pumped up to 36 PSI. Now, if you pump up your tires to 100 PSI, and don't do that because your tires will explode. They're not built to, to do that. But if they were strong enough, sturdy enough that you could pump them up to 100 PSI, well, the square root of 100 is 10 times 9 is 90. So a 100 PSI tire will hydroplane at about 90 miles per hour. Useful information if you're, uh, if you're designing airplane tires and you want them to not skid on the runway. So anyway, now that is an empirical equation. It works for tires. It works for PSI and miles per hour. Um, but we can't say build an entire physics around that weird formula. It's just a rule of thumb, which is useful for that narrow subject under those narrow parameters. Um, now, if you if you pumped up the tire to like 10,000 psi, uh, it probably wouldn't work anymore. It would probably uh, it only works for the range of normal tire pressures. Okay, that's an empirical equation. When Maxwell came out with his, Maxwell's equations, they were considered empirical equations. They worked for calculating things about light, but they didn't seem to be broadly true about everything in the universe. They were just useful for that little narrow piece of physics. Now, why did they think that? A lot of reasons, but one of them was that if you crunch the numbers in a couple of these equations just the right way, you get this weird result, which implies that the speed of light is always the same for everybody, no matter what they're doing or where they're going, which can't be true because Newton said it could be true. But this Michelson-Morley experiment, that the light speed of light is the same for everybody, regardless of the motion of the observer, appears in Maxwell's equations, but it was ignored because it couldn't be true. Okay, that brings us to Einstein. 